وصلي على رسول النبي الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إحنا السراط المستقيم سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبه إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم بارك على سيدنا مولانا محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبصار وديائها وعلى آله وسهله دائما أبدا سلاة وسلاما عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته رمضان مبارك إن شاء الله we will continue today with uh, the um, story of Ibrahim alayhi salam as we started uh, uh, last time. And we left off where the people had placed Ibrahim alayhi salam in, in the catapult to throw him into the fire. And if you remember, you know, Ibrahim alayhi salam at this time is not making any dua. You know, he's remembering his Lord, but not making any, he's not supplicating that, oh Allah, save me from this. You know, and when Jibreel al Islam comes uh, to uh, help him, you know, he sends him off simply asking, Has, is Allah subhanahu wa seeing me? Is he looking upon me with pleasure? And when he said yes, then he said, I don't need any help. You know, if Allah is pleased uh, with him, then nothing else matters. And so, if, uh, so for Ibrahim al Islam, if Allah was pleased with him being thrown into the fire, he was pleased with being thrown into the fire. You know, this is uh, a very high level of Iman. Uh, it's being pleased with the pleasure of Allah, no matter what. And so, um, you know, as this process is taking place, so you know they have him in, they have him tied up in the catapult, and they throw, they th eventually they they launch him into the fire. And again, this is a massive fire. And as he's being thrown into the fire, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gives an order to the fire, you know, which is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Anbiya, verse number. 69, you know, where Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala says, uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala says that to the fire, He says, O oh fire, be cool and salam, peace or safety for Ibrahim. You know, when we look at this order, you know, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala commands the fire to do two things. One is to be cool upon Ibrahim, and the other is to be a source of safety or peace for Ibrahim. If you simply order the fire to be cool on Ibrahim, then you know coldness also burns. Now, if you look at uh, tissue under the microscope, that's that's from frostbite or from a fire burn. They look the same. And so Allah Subhanahu wa Taala orders the fire to be cool at the same time to be safe. Uh, and so. But, it, but he only orders it for Ibrahim alayhi salam. So this is an important point to note here. For everybody else who's looking at the fire, the fire is still fire. You know, and anybody else who had gone close to the fire would have been burned. Yet Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he's thrown in, is not even touched by the fire. In fact, uh, nothing that is close to him or associated with him in a good way is touched by the fire. The ropes that tied him were burned, but not even a hair of Ibrahim al Islam was singed. So this in itself is, 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 is part of the miracle. Ibrahim al Islam himself says that the time that he spent in the fire, the 40 days that he spent in the fire, you know, were the best 40 days of his life. You know, he took his time. You know, he's there relishing the, the salam or, or the peace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as you know, he makes his way out slow, gradually. And of course, wherever he is, it's like a garden for him. You know, the coolness. You know, like you walk out in a cool spring morning. You know, it just it feels good. And so Ibrahim al-Islam takes forty days to eventually come out. 
and after 40 days he comes out of this fire and again or, or and basically it took 40 days for this fire to to uh, cool itself again it's still hot for everybody else it's only for Ibrahim al -Islam. you know and this is one point here as well that you know Allah SWT has given characteristics to things you know like fire burns water drowns uh, you know if I put my hand in the fire and say oh you know see uh, and I'm just going to put my hand in the fire and I shouldn't complain when it burns because Allah SWT has given the authority to the fire to burn but he made the exception for Ibrahim. There are other exceptions, but here we're talking, you know, the exception is for Ibrahim. And so, you know, as the fire cools down, you know, the embers are gone and Ibrahim makes his way out. You know, the people see this. They see Ibrahim being thrown into this fire that, you know, that nothing could have survived. And yet Ibrahim comes out. And they still reject him. When the hearts are sealed, you know, and which re literally means being devoid of the love of Allah and His Messenger, then nothing can penetrate it. You know, you can show people all of the signs. I mean, this is this is a miracle that's being shown in front of him. The 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 life of Ibrahim al Islam, him living through this, is a miracle in itself, and yet they still deny him. You know, and they not and and we'll see where people deny even greater things than this. And especially when we talk about Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you know, simply looking at Rasulullah sallallahu and denying him is, uh, I mean, Rasulullah sallallahu himself is the greatest miracle. Somewhere around this point, you know, at some point, you know, the father of Ibrahim al-Islam, or not the father, but the other, you know, Azar dies. You know, because, you know, in English when I say father, you know, you, we naturally incline toward the biological father. But as I mentioned before, you know, Azar in the Quran, every place in the Quran where Ibrahim refers, Al-Islam refers to him, he says, Abi. Uh, where Allah SWT refers to him, he says, Le Abi. It's always re referred to as Ab. Azar is always referred to as Ab. And we talked about this earlier where the... In Arabic, Ab can be used for biological father, but it can also be used for paternal uncle. It can also be used for someone who raised you. So it has different uses. Uh, and Azar, you know, because Ibrahim al-Islam's biological father died early, and Azar is the paternal uncle. You know, he's referred, to, Ibrahim al-Islam refers to him as Ab. We talked about the proof that he's not the biological father of Ibrahim al -Islam from various narrations of Rasulullah so I'm talking about Rasulullah's own lineage, his own ancestry and nothing, none of them being touched by uh, the effects of Jahiliyyah. But there's also proof of this in the Quran itself. Uh, in Surah Tawbah, uh, verse 113, Surah number 9, verse 113 and then 114, Allah Subhanahu says in 113 that it is not befitting or is not for the prophets uh, or for those who believe that they should ask forgiveness for the mushrikeen, for the polytheist, uh, even if they are close relatives, especially when it has become clear to them that they are companions of the fire. And in the next verse, verse 114, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately says, you know, yet Ibrahim al-Islam's request for his abi, le abi, for, 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 for Azar, was you know, due to a promise that he had made to him. But when it became clear to him that, that he is the enemy of Allah, then Ibrahim al-Islam disassociated with him completely. You know, and then Allah SWT says about Ibrahim al-Islam, he says that he is compassionate and patient. Yet in Surah Ibrahim, Surah number 14, if we read verse number 41, where Allah SWT says, you know, the famous dua of Ibrahim al-Islam, رَبَّنَا اُغْفِرْ لِي وَلِوَلَدَيَّ وَلِلْمُؤْمِينَ يَوْمَ يَقُومُ الْحِسَابِ You know, that, O oh, our Lord, forgive me and forgive my parents uh, and, and the believers, uh, you know, and you are the best to take account. Here, Ibrahim al-Islam uses the word وَلِوَلَدَيَّ and my parents. Walid, 
and Walda, uh, which are specific for biological father and biological mother. When Ibrahim, if you read the context of this, you know, starting from verse number 35 and you come on down, you realize that this dua Ibrahim al-Islam made was made in his old age, much, much later. And when he makes this dua, which we all repeat many times, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not say, oh, you can't make this dua for your father, because he doesn't make it for Azar. He says, Rabbana firli wale wale dayya. You know, here, wadid, uh, which again is specific for biological father. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not, you know, say, no, you can't do this or anything else. You know, and this is a dua that the believers make repeatedly. So this in itself is proof that Azar is not the biological father of Ibrahim uh, and, and again, the biological father's name was Taruk. Uh, because Ibrahim al -Islam is also carrying that nur that has been passed down the genera through the generations, the nur of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And so his father also, his biological father also carried that nur. And that nur is not going to be carried by anyone who is impure. And again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Tawbah mentions the mushrikeen as najis, as being impure. You know, after Ibrahim al Islam comes out of the fire, now the attention turns toward the king, you know, because people, you know, they're saying, okay, we can't deal with him. So now the authorities are going to deal with him. And so Ibrahim al Islam is taken in front of, in the court of Namrud, or Nimrod in English. Uh, and we read the dialogue between him and uh, between Ibrahim al Islam and Namrud in Surah Baqarah, so verses 258. Where Ibrahim al Islam, when he's talking to Namrud, he says, You know, because Namrud claimed to be king, it, well, he was king, but he claimed to be lord. And Ibrahim al Islam says that, My lord, he gives life and he causes death. And so Namrud, he says, Well, I can give life and cause death. So he had two prisoners brought to in front of him, and one of them was supposed to be released, and the other one was supposed to be executed. So the one who was supposed to be released, he said, execute him. And the one who was supposed to be executed, he said, oh, I, I free him. So he says, see, I cause life and I give, uh, I cause life and death. And so now Ibrahim al Islam comes back with something that he has no response to. He says, my Lord, you know, causes the sun to rise from the east. You know, if you are something, then you cause it to rise from the west. And of course, he has no response to this. Uh, and, and, you know, just like most people these days, you know, when they can't respond to you, well, I still think this. You know, no proof of anything, but I still think this. And go on. And the same thing. But there's an interesting point here. You know, Ibrahim used, al Islam uses these arguments. But now the question comes, you know, if somebody to us in our appearance causes life or death. You know, one point here also is life in itself is a miracle. You know, and I'm not saying individual life itself. Individual life itself is also a miracle. But life... At, as a whole, in general, the existence of life is a miracle. A miracle being something that's impossible, that has become that 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 manifests itself. You know, this is what a miracle is. That's you know, uh, from a physical uh, standpoint, from a standpoint of, of of intellect and a standpoint of of physics and science and every other aspect, it should not exist or it should not happen, and yet it does happen. So if you think about life from a scientific standpoint, life should not exist, period. You know, even from an evolutionary standpoint, there should, no be, should, there should not be any life. You know, if you look at it from an evolutionary standpoint, you know, the way species evolve, uh, you know, the evolutionary process is to adapt to an environment. You know, environment change, so now the species shifts uh, and you get other characteristics coming out. Uh, one point, another point here is that Darwin wasn't the first to come up with the evolutionary uh, theory. You know, this was actually a Muslim scholar a thousand years before, before Darwin, 
who wrote the Book of Animals, who talks about this change, you know, within species and through species. But he also, but the pet, but the thing is, he's talking about it from the power of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala to do all of this. Whereas these people take it, you know, from an atheistic standpoint, saying, "Oh, you know, this is how it happens, and there's no other explanation for it." So if you look at the existence of life, we should not, there should not be any life. Because, okay, you have the planets that have formed, and even the, even the existence of the planet shouldn't be there. You know, of course, they say, oh, you know, you go back to the cosmic dust, whether you believe in the Big Bang Theory or the Nebula Theory or whichever theory, you know, it always ha there's always a starting point. There's some, something that existed that started it. And so you have that starting point, and okay, now you form the planets, fine. You know, but then what is the need for life? None of the other planets have any life. Why do we have life here? They say, well, there was that cosmic goo, you know, and then you get that one cell organism. But again, same thing. What was the need for that? There was no need for it from a scientific standpoint. You know, the planet was functioning without life. The planet's probably functioning better without life. You look at what mankind has done to the earth. Uh, you know, these days everybody's locked up. You go outside and the air is so much cleaner. You know, you look at the sky now and you can actually see uh, without the haze. You know, and that's just within a month. You know, so again, life in itself is a miracle. The existence of life is a miracle. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives these prophets authority to do other miracles. So again, back to this point where he says, okay, I give, you know, my Lord gives life and he causes death. And, you know, Namrud, of course, he has this comeback for that. But the question here is, if somebody, if we see somebody in appearance giving life, does that make him God? Yeah. And of course the answer is no. You know, we look at Isa alayhi salam. You know, what would he do? He raised the dead. You know, unfortunately there were those who got confused by this and they said, oh, he is God. Yeah. And where he is not God, he never claimed to be God. Even in their book, there's no claim that he claims to be God. There's no place where you find a claim of him being God. In his words. So, so that in itself, but this was something that Ibrahim is using as a, as a reasoning to try to get him to think. The same thing with the other argument is that, you know, okay, if you are something, if you have some authority, then bring it from the West. And of course, he couldn't do that. So now the question is if somebody brings it from the West, does that make him God? And again, the answer is no. Has this happened? Yes. You know, just like, you know, wake or giving life to the dead, Isa al-Islam did, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi did. You know, the Jal will do that when he comes. Because he is the imposter, Christ. He will do, Allah Subhanahu will give him the authority to do this. So the same thing, if somebody brings the, the, the sun from the west, does it make him God? Of course not. Has it been done? Yes. Yeah. After the battle of Khaybar, you know, when Khaybar was conquered, uh, Rasulullah would send various companions out to, for various you know, missions, and then they would come back and, and, and stuff. So Rasulullah he sends out Ali on a mission. By the time Ali had returned, Rasulullah along with all the other companions had already made Asr, Salat. Ali had not made his Asr. But you know, sometimes you're tired, you want to take a break, and then you make your Salat. So that's what he did. He, he comes, he sits down, with the intention of getting up and making Salat, you know, in a few minutes. Rasulullah he comes and he lays his blessed head upon the blessed thigh of Ali. And he goes to sleep. And Ali is looking at the blessed, the beautiful, blessed face of Rasulullah. And he's looking at the sun. His focus is here on, on the majestic face of Rasulullah, but he's also noticing the sun going down. Time for Asr is going. But Ali is Ali. 
Rasulullah said, I am Madinatul Ilm, Aliun Babuha. That I am the city of knowledge and Ali is its door. Among the Sahaba Ikram, Ali Radun was the greatest faqih. You know, the knowledge of the fiqh, you know, no one, no one even claimed, came close to his level of knowledge. This is why the companions, they used to say that if we hear something from an authentic source saying that Ali Radun said this, then we don't need any other proof. And so, the sun is going down and Ali Radun is looking. Looking at the beautiful face of Rasulullah Sallallahu yeah, He doesn't say, oh, Ya Rasulullah, please wake up. You know, I got to go make my asr. Nothing. He's simply absorbed in, in, in that beauty. The sun goes down and the, uh, the uh, adhan for asr is about to be, uh, for, for maghrib is about to be made. And Rasulullah Sallallahu gets up. And he looks at Ali uh, with some concerns upon his face, you know, tears flowing, flowing down his cheeks. You know, he's missed Asr. Ali Radun was also known for his ibadah, or for his worship among the companions. And Rasulullah Sassim asked him, he says, what's wrong? And Ali Radun, Ya Rasulullah Sassim, I missed my Asr. I did not make Asr. So Rasulullah Sallallahu he says, he says, Allahumma innahu kana fi ta'atik wa ta'a rasulatik, rasulik wa ta'a rasulik, fardud alayhi shams. That, oh Allah, Ali was busy in your obedience and the obedience of your Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So return the sun, or return for him the sun. And the sun came back and stopped in the position of Asr and waited. And Ali Rado made his Asr Salat. And as soon as he finished his Asr, the sun went back down. The narrator of this hadith is Asma bint Umais, anha, who is the wife of Jafar al Tayyar. You know, the older brother of Ali, radiallahu And after her husband will be martyred, will become the wife of Abu Bakr Siddiq, radiallahu And then after he passes, will become the wife of Sayyidina Ali, karamallahu wajh. She had just returned from Abyssinia along with her husband and met Rasulullah Sussman at Khaybar. And so she is the narrator of this hadith. Imam Tabari, Imam Tahawi, say that the hadith is say. Ibn Hajar Asqalani says all of the narrators of the hadith are strong. Qadi Ayaz says that it's Hassan. Badruddin Aini says that it's Sahih. Multiple, multiple uh, muhaddisin, traditional muhaddisin, traditional scholars of the hadith say that the hadith is say. And there's not just one. Most of them are narrated through Asma bint Umais, but there are, there are some that are through Abu Hurair, radiallahu You know, because you do have certain modern-day scholars who say, oh, no, this is fabricator, or this is da'if, or whatever, you know, because of their, their animosity against the family of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of those who's quoted as saying that it's fabricated is also the one who uh, charged the son of Sayyidah Abdul Qadir Jilani with uh, witchcraft uh, and was later found to be a liar uh, in, this, in this charge. So these are the kinds of people that, that challenge the hadith. Uh, Imam Tahawi and uh, Qadi Ayyad and, and Jalaluddin Suyut. Jalaluddin Suyut wrote a whole book on this and says that this is one of the proofs of Nabu of prophethood. And so, again, the bringing of the sun back from the west doesn't make anybody God. You know, because, you know, but when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives someone the authority to do this and praises his authority, then we cannot deny it. 
this is the authority Allah SWT has given our Rasulullah SAW because everything, is subs everything in the universe is subservient to him. And so, you know, and there are many other aspects that, that we learn from this. Uh, and, and I'll probably bounce back and forth at times you know, upon these points. Uh, but, you know, this, after this argument, you know, of course, Namrud, he has no, he has no argument. He has no, no way to come back to this. So he wants to fight a war against Allah. He says, I want to fight your Lord. And there are many things that happen in between. And then eventually, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, orders Ibrahim al-Islam when the final punishment is to come. He orders Ibrahim al-Islam to leave with, with, with those who are with him. So he leaves with his nephew Lut salam, who's the son of his uh, older brother, uh, his wife Sarah, and so they leave. And a few handful leave with him. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, he creates a situation where he sends mosquitoes. You know, Namrud has his army set. I'm going to fight. You know, you know Ibrahim al salam says, fine. You know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends his army of mosquitoes. And they attack, and of course, you know, you can imagine this army, you know, uh, ready with swords and, and arrows and, and all of their armaments, you know, and what are they fighting? Mosquitoes. You can barely see them. Just like today, Allah SWT has sent another one of his soldiers, you know, a virus that you can't even see unless you're, you have, you know, significant microscopes. And so for Namrud, he sends mosquitoes, and the mosquitoes come, and the army, you know, they're trying to uh, beat, the, you know, mosquito biting, and they're beating themselves, and slashing each other, and, you know, the army is destroyed uh, with mosquitoes. Of course, mosquitoes also uh, bring other diseases with them. But the mosquito Allah SWT sent for Namrud was not even a complete mosquito. It was missing a leg. And that mosquito went up his nostril. And, you know, mosquito flying around in his sinus cavities. You know, the only time he would get any relief was when it was uh, moving. You know, otherwise when it's sitting, it's, it, it was bothering him, biting him in the sinuses. Uh, and so now Namrud, he has two of his men beat his head. Because, you know, beat the head, you def uh, deflect the attention from, from that discomfort and plus you know, as they're beating his head the mosquitoes moving around so it's not bothering him as much which is also interesting because these are men who he's paid these are hired help so he's paying people to beat him you know, along this process also you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands everything in, in the kingdom of Namrud all of you know, his palaces all of this this the structures that he's built to start saying the kalma la ilaha illallah Ibrahim Khalilullah you know, and, when, and anytime anything says this Namrud has it destroyed so he destroys his own kingdom and then this mosquito that's bothering him the men who are beating his head eventually get tired and beat him so hard that he dies from the beating And so, the, again, the mosquito Allah SWT sent for Namrud, you know, was a lame mosquito. You know? And he dies in this fashion. And all of his kingdom is destroyed by himself. He himself destroys his kingdom. There's not even the remnants of the kingdom left. You know, I didn't realize this point until, you know, when I was in high school, one of my teachers, he asked for a translation of the Quran. I gave it to him and we started talking about Ibrahim al-Islam, and he was saying that, you know, there's no archaeological evidence of Namrud, of Nimrod, of the existence of that kingdom, you know, which they will never find, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had Namrud destroy it himself. You know, he destroyed his own kingdom, so there's nothing left for them to find. And so this is, you know, we will continue from here next time, inshallah. Uh, and next time I will start with the question that I asked last time, or one of the questions that I asked, is why do we have Prophet Ibrahim al-Islam, great prophets like Ibrahim al-Islam, Uzair al-Islam, Musa al-Islam, and other prophets, asking Allah SWT, oh Allah, show me this, or show me that. Whereas Rasulullah never asked, so what is the difference? So we'll start with that.
next time. Uh, inshallah, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us uh, and guide us and, and support us and, and fill our hearts with His true love. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina wa ala Muhammadin wa ala salli ala Sayyidina wa ala Muhammadin wa ala Sayyidina Rabbana ablana min azwajina wa dhuriyatana Rabbana atakabal dua Rabbana adalamna anfusana wa illam tawfir lana wa tarhamna lanakum minil khasirin Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirata hasanatan wa fina adhaab al-nar Rabbana aghfir li wa li wa ladaya wa li al-mu'minina yawma yaqum al-hasab Ya Allah, guide us and keep us safe from uh, from all uh, sorts of harm, especially the spiritual harm uh, that has become prevalent these days uh, and protect us and our families and, and all of those who are from the Ummah of Rasulullah from uh, the effects of and the fitna of Dajjal uh, and fill our hearts with your love and the love of your beloved Prophet Muhammad وسلم, his family and, compa and companions and all of those whom you love because this is the only thing that will protect us uh, in this time uh, of this fitna uh, وصلى الله تعالى على خير خلقه محمد وعاله وصحبه أجمعين